Good evening, and welcome to the Story of Liberty. Today we have an interview with Dave Weldon, who recently announced his run for the U.S. Senate in the state of Florida. He is joining a field of Republicans seeking to unseat Democratic Senator Bill Nelson. And now for our interview. Dr. Weldon, it's uh, good to see you and be with you again. Um, you're, you're in the race. Uh, you're on the campaign trail and uh, traveling. We've got a big state, so you're, you're traveling all the way from the Keys up to Tallahassee over to Gainesville, and you were at the Villages, I guess, uh, a few days ago. You know, in this race right now, uh, from what I hear, there's, you have three or four opponents. I think there was actually one person that may have been in that already dropped out. Lemu is in, right? Is that a, and, um, of course, Connie Mack and some others. Um, obviously, to get the opportunity to run uh, in the election against Nelson, you have to win the uh, nomination in the party. Um, that being said, uh, how do you feel your chances are? And, and uh, you just really jumped in, and, and how are things going? And also, uh, how do you view your uh, competition? Well, those are great questions. Um, it, it is uh, a multi-candidate primary for the privilege to go on and challenge Bill Nelson. And uh, let, me, let me just say a few things about Bill Nelson first, because uh, I know him pretty well, and I know there are a lot of people here on the Treasure Coast who, who know him. Um, he really needs to retire, and he should have retired, because, you know, you look at what are the problems facing this country today. We've got high unemployment, we've got these horrible deficits, we have these entitlement programs that are completely unsustainable. We're asking young working people in their 20s, 30s, and 40s to pay into Social Security and Medicare, and everybody, uh, the, the, all the economists can show you that they're completely unsustainable the way they are and they need to be reformed, and Bill Nelson has done absolutely nothing to try to fix these problems our, our nation is facing today let alone he's on the wrong side of pro-life issues and, and a whole lot of other issues. So I'm in a, a Republican primary. I did jump in late. I think I've got a great shot. Why? Because I think I'm the authentic conservative in this race, and most Republican primary voters are really strong conservatives. They're conservative on fiscal policy and social policy. I have a solid track record of fighting for those issues, strongly pro-life, strongly in support of, of family being defined as traditional marriage between a man and a woman. And, and I, I didn't just provide lip service to that. I actually fought for those things. Now, there are uh, several candidates in the field. Connie Mack is one of them. Uh, I personally think he's mainly riding on his father's name. I don't think he really distinguished himself enough in the House. Um, and, and George Lemieux transiently was a U.S. Senator when he was appointed to that position by our former governor, Charlie Crist, when he was a Republican. Then, of course, he switched parties. Uh, and then there's another fellow in the field, uh, Colonel McAllister. He's run statewide before. I think he ran for governor a few years ago. Nice man. Uh, I agree with him on a lot of issues, uh, but a lot of people just, you know, don't take him seriously as a serious candidate. Uh, so how am I different? In what ways am I different? Well. Uh, number one, I think I am the authentic conservative, the guy who has the track record uh, and willing to stand up and fight for those issues. I think you're going to see in the weeks ahead a lot of leaders uh, in, 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 in the nation stepping forward and saying they're going to get behind Dave Weldon and they're endorsing Dave Weldon, uh, acknowledging that I am I'm the conservative. Uh, and people need to learn more about me. They can go to my website. Uh, Dave Weldon for Senate dot com, uh, and and it's now just a splash page, and we're building it out. It's going to have a lot of more information. It's going to have information on pro life. It's going to have information on on family values, um, and and we're going to build it out. And it's going to be a full up website in the next few days. Uh, probably most importantly, I need people. I'm getting in late. It's a big state, as you pointed out. Uh, you know, when you're in Pensacola, you're closer to New Orleans than you are to Orlando. And as everybody knows, who's ever driven down to the Keys from here, it's a six-hour drive to get there. Big state, lots of territory. Uh, but I think I can do it. Obviously, one of the most important things, I'm going to need the resources and people can donate on my website. 
but the other important thing is um, I need volunteers and, and, and let me just say, you know, I, I need people to just step up and call their neighbors and their friends if they don't have time to volunteer, at least, you know, let others know that, that they're going to support me. Uh, what I need is grassroots. I need a brush fire. Um, and I think I can overcome the lateness of me getting in this if people will really stand up and get behind me. And it's going to require the, the real solid conservatives to do that. And I have a track record of doing that and fighting for that. You know, just as a, uh, as a voter myself and in, in watching your career uh, in Congress, uh, and you served six terms, I guess, in Congress, seven terms in Congress, you're really the only candidate in this race that has a consistent track record. The other folks in here uh, that you just mentioned have some track record, but it's very limited. And we really don't know a lot about them. I think one of the big advantages that you have, Dr. Weldon, is that you really have th the history behind you to show what you stand for, how you argue uh, on the House floor, how you did over the years. Uh, as, as example, how you stood for the precious value of life over and over was when it wasn't popular, and a lot of other conservative issues. You know, one of the main things when I, you know, I'm a business guy. I talk to uh, people in business all the time, and they really feel that, in addition to losing our liberty, that the government is now just taxing and regulating and controlling so much of private enterprise that those basic freedoms that we had that Adam Smith talked about, the freedom to buy, the freedom to sell, and the freedom to fail even in a business are going away, that it's, it's becoming hard. What would you say to the guy out there trying to start a business, even in a, a down economy? You know, what advice would you give? What could you do, what would you try to do uh, in your platform if, if you get elected to make it uh, more palatable for uh, someone to, uh, this is one of the greatest things that, that our nation had, the, 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 these liberties to go out and try to start a business. There's a million things you could do in America in the land of the free. What would you do to basically make the government smaller? Uh, and so the tentacles of government are not so entrenched in our lives every day, especially as it relates to the economy, and starting a business, hiring employees? Well, I th one of the first things I think we need to do is have a regulatory moratorium. In other words, say, freeze, no more regulations. And then I think we need to go back and look at the regulations that have come down the pike from this government, from the Obama administration over the last four years, and see if we can repeal some of them see if we can change some of them. And now we're going to listen to a clip of Representative Dave Weldon on the floor discussing stem cell breakthroughs using stem cells derived without harming or using human embryos. That's for five minutes. Mr. Speaker, this summer has been a breathtaking one for stem cell researchers around the world but not because of embryonic stem cells or cloning. Building on important work published last year showing that it is possible to reprogram an adult, stem, an adult cell back to its primitive embryonic-like state, researchers led by Doug Melton at Harvard University have done what was thought impossible only a few short years ago. Melton and his team used mice to show that it is possible to directly reprogram support cells or exocrine cells of the pancreas into insulin-producing beta cells without ever removing any cells from the pancreas. Amazingly, it appears that one adult cell type has been directly and specifically transformed into another adult cell type. In other words, a simple injection of three critical reprogramming factors successfully produced insulin producing beta cells and gave patients with diabetes and their families new reason to hope in the power of regenerative medicine. Melton and his colleagues have brought us one step closer to what many have called the holy grail of regenerative medicine. He has shown that in principle it is possible to induce the body to heal itself by reprogramming one cell type into another. 
Imagine that your beta cells can no longer make insulin and you are diabetic, perhaps because of immune destruction of your insulin producing cells like in type 1 diabetes or perhaps because like in type 2 diabetes your insul insulin producing cells have just given up. If the work Melton describes can be reproduced in human patients, diabetes patients would have to receive a simple injection maybe two or three times and with that their pancreas could, could, could resume producing insulin and they would be cured of their diabetes, no longer requiring insulin injections, no longer requiring painful pinpricks. Of course, Melton's work is a long way from the clinic. Mice are not people and some of the details must be modified to ensure that the injection is safe and won't cause tumors. But this work represents an enormous step forward and should be pursued with all of the resources NIH can provide. This exciting news comes on the heels of another announcement also this summer that researchers from Harvard and Columbia have used the reprogramming protocol to create 21 disease-specific stem cell lines that will enable researchers to intimately study diseases such as Lou Gehrig's disease, type 1 diabetes, Parkinson's, and muscular dystrophy. And it is important to note that this technique also does not require the creation, destruction, or even the presence of human embryos. These cells may not be ready to transplant into humans in the near term, but they will be available for research today and for use in screening for drugs. So in a few short months, the promise of regenerative medicine comes closer to reality. Just last year, scientists and cloning advocates told us that we had to do human cloning or at least to create cloned human embryos so that we could accomplish these two goals that were deemed essential for moving regenerative medicine forward, creating disease-specific cell lines and regenerating stem cells that could be a perfect match for patients affected by these diseases. Both of these goals have been accomplished with the reprogramming protocol. No cloning, no human embryo stem cells required. To say it another way, there is no medical reason to proceed with research into cloning human embryos for their stem cells because that science is obsolete, it is more cumbersome, it is more expensive. We have a better, quicker, easier way to do it. Now, I will note that these researchers who were involved with these breathtaking breakthroughs have done the politically correct thing and have said we still have to move forward with embryo stem cell research for compelling reasons. <clears throat> what those compelling reasons are, I do not know and I disagree with them. It cannot be denied that research is moving a ho forward at a breakneck speed and the Bush policy is still fully in place. This work also lends more support for all the adult stem cell work that we have been talking about in this body for years. For years, embryonic stem cell research advocates have claimed that only embryonic stem cells could be transformed this way. Now we have direct evidence that it is not necessary. Science is moving beyond the debate. Science is taking us in a direction of ethically responsible research. What are some very important issues right now um, happening in our country? And what are some things that you feel um, that are happening that need to be changed? You know, the, the sanctity of marriage, I think, is being eroded. You had the President of the United States recently come out for gay marriage. I think that's wrong that he would do that. And, you know, the economy is hurting. People are looking for jobs. Uh, unemployment is, is going up. It's not going down. Uh, tax policy needs to be reformed. Uh, and then, of course, you know, you got the Obama health care plan out there, which is a, a whole additional issue. Uh, so it's a lot of issues. I will say this. I'm happy practicing medicine. I'm not happy with Washington, and I'm willing to go back. Well, that's great news. Um, there's actually an event coming up uh, next Friday, uh, June the uh, 8th. Uh, at the courthouse uh, regarding what you're talking about, uh, the Obamacare. I guess that's actually the day the decision will be coming down uh, from the court. 
Um, you know, what would you say to our listeners about that, regardless of uh, how the decision uh, is made and relative to the, the mandates and the requirements? Uh, what, what would you say about the entire program uh, of Obamacare in general? Well, it's a, it's a terrible piece of legislation. I, I, the overreaching nature of it is just astronomical when you think about it. And, you know, if you really wanted to just make it easier for people who are low income and can't afford health insurance to get health insurance, give them a health insurance tax credit. You know, we have the earned incomes tax credit. If your heart is really to help the poor, give the poor a health insurance tax credit so they can go out and buy health insurance. Uh, make it easier for people to, to get low-cost insurance by allowing people to buy health insurance across state lines. You know, the state legislatures put a lot of mandate on these health insurance companies. Mandates drive up the cost. You know, when you put a mandate on a health insurance plan that says you have to do this and you have to do that, like the Obama plan does, forcing Catholic institutions and other religious institutions to offer contraceptive services when they have religious objections to contraceptive services. Uh, so the, the Obama health care plan, in, in my opinion, is an abomination, no pun intended. But probably more fundamentally important is if this piece of legislation is allowed to stand and is not struck down by the court, it really has the potential to erode our federal system and and really damage the Constitution. The individual mandate that's in this bill, where the federal government is standing up and saying, you have to buy health insurance, um, and, and giving the federal government that kind of power, it's completely unprecedented in our legal system. It's completely unprecedented, in, and, and in my opinion, it's totally unprecedented unconstitutional. If you look at the history and the traditions of the Constitution and our federal system of government and what made it great, and, and then you look at this piece of legislation, it's really, really bad. And, it, and if it, it's not overturned, it's actually one of the reasons why I want to run for the Senate and I want to go and serve, because you're gonna, if, if the court doesn't undo it, you're going to have to change some of these things through the legislative process. Amazing how both of their efforts uh, were rewarded, and liberty did spread. Um, Reagan was unbelievable. It was unbelievable, the Berlin Wall and things happening. One of the quotes that I always, Reagan had several great quotes. One of the, my favorite was he said that the government's view of the economy could be summed up in a few short phrases. He said if it moves, tax it. If it keeps moving, regulate it, and if it stops moving, subsidize it. It's an interesting quote that he he said. He had other ones, of course. He, remember, he said, uh, "Be aware if the government comes to your door and says we're the government and we're here to help you." Um, it'd be great to have a president like Ronald Reagan again someday. And I know you share a lot of his views. Um, Tell us a little bit about your view of, of what the government should be in terms of regulating or having involvement with, with business. I can see the point, like you said, make sure that a gallon of gas is a gallon of gas. Making sure a, a carton of milk is an actual gallon. Outside of that, the, it seems uh, to me that the involvement should be limited. Absolutely. and, and for no other reason, the more the government meddles, the higher the prices go up, and uh, the less efficient we become, and the more costly it is to create jobs, and we have a terrible crisis in job creation today. Um, I loved Ronald Reagan. He was an inspiration for me. Um, I, to, to give you another favorite uh, Ronald Reagan quote, uh, there's no such thing as eternal life except maybe a federal government program. And, uh, and that's absolutely true. I have to tell you, I've been part of Washington and trying to cut government and trying to cut uh, government programs, and, and it's, it's absolutely brutal. It's absolutely brutal. And the people uh, 
who, who benefit from these programs, they form special interest, interest groups, they, form, they hire lobbyists, and ending some of these federal programs can be an absolute nightmare. Now, what does that have to do with job creation? What does that have to do with the economy? Well, if the government is out there getting bigger and bigger and borrowing and borrowing and sucking up capital, it takes money out of the productive side of our economy, which is where most of your jobs are created. And we need a, a, a real jobs program like Ronald Reagan had in 1980 that will really put people back to work. And I think there's a lot of things that we could be doing to get this economy going again. Repeal Obamacare. You know, the Obamacare plan and all these new regulations that are coming down, they create something called uncertainty for the entrepreneurial class. For a person with capital, a person with a business, to make a decision that they're going to take some of their hard-earned money and build a new plant or open a new shopping plaza or expand an existing production facility and hire more people, that is a risk. And they usually will not do that in an environment of uncertainty. And we need, we desperately need to create a, an environment of confidence and certainty for the entrepreneurial class. What, what else can we do? Well, I would say one thing is we need to extend the Bush uh, tax cuts. Those are slated to expire. Uh, I don't know if you remember the history on this. Usually you cut taxes, you cut taxes, and then if you want to raise taxes again, you raise taxes. The Bush tax cuts were unique because there was a senator from West Virginia, his name was Byrd, and he managed to put a provision in that bill 10 years ago that all of these tax provisions would expire at the end of 10 years. Well, lo and behold, the day now comes. It's December of this year, and those provisions are going to expire. And that's, in my opinion, hurting the entrepreneurial class and preventing us from having more job creation. Uh, one of the provisions in particular in that bill that I find most egregious is the marriage penalty provisions. We put a whole bunch of provisions in the Bush tax credit, the tax cuts, that helped prevent the marriage penalty, where two people, two working people get married and they see their tax rates go up. And so what do they do? They live outside the bonds of, of matrimony. And, and that's bad. I mean, that is just flat out bad to have a federal government that places a tax burden on people when they get married. Your taxes should go down when you get married. You should be encouraged to get married, not discouraged from getting married. What else can we do? Well, I would say one other additional thing that we can do to help create jobs in this country today is we can lower the corporate tax rate. Um, we have the highest corporate tax rate in the world. What impact does that have? Well, a lot of companies are saying, the heck with the United States, let's incorporate overseas. Well, what happens when they do that? Well, you bring the headquarters overseas, you bring the banking operation overseas, you bring the, all the higher level personnel. They're no longer living in the United States, they're no longer shopping in the United States, and it just, it hurts our economy. We need to lower the corporate tax rate. Thank you for joining us on the first half of the Story of Liberty. We will be continuing our interview with Dr. Dave Weldon in the second half. Don't forget, you can find all of our interviews, history programs, and news articles at our website, thestoryofliberty.net. You can also enjoy listening to our history programs and interviews in the comfort of your living room on our Roku channel, which you can find in the Roku channel store or at our website, thestoryofliberty.net, where we have a link where you can add our Roku channel to your Roku player. We hope you stay tuned for the second half where we will be continuing our interview with Dr. Dave Weldon. God bless you and have a great rest of the day. Providers and it affects consumers. I mean, it has mandates on pricing. Uh, the, most, the most important and most significant thing is it's gonna place requirements on uh, small businesses uh, that if you have more than, I think the cutoff is 50 employees, you have to offer health insurance to your employees. And there are thousands of businesses all over the country that are currently offering health insurance, uh, that are currently not offering health insurance that are gonna have to do it under this bill. Well, who's gonna pay for that? If you're, 
let's say you own a restaurant and it's a pretty busy restaurant and you have enough employees that's over the threshold that you bill uh, and you now have to o offer insurance um, and then a smaller restaurant down the street uh, doesn't meet the requirements they're going to be able to undercut you on price and so it, the potential effect is going to be astronomical on businesses throughout the country and now there was an easy way they could have done this they could have just put you know, a tax credit or some sort of incentive for businesses to offer health insurance, but instead they turn around and they use the heavy hand of a mandate from the federal government. And probably the absolute worst thing that they've done is they've hired 20,000 new IRS agents, which it, it, it's just, I think, pretty scary to think about it. These guys are not going to be sitting, you know, in offices just typing up reports. They're going to be out there looking for people to punish them. Uh, and this is all in the name of providing people you know, more health insurance. It's a heavy-handed uh, approach of the government. So in addition to mandates on individuals saying you must buy health insurance, uh, there are mandates on businesses saying you have to offer health insurance. Uh, probably, um, in my opinion, the, the more onerous of the two from a constitutional perspective is the mandate on individuals. So this bill, you know, the other thing about this bill uh, is the cost associated with it. It has all kinds of provisions in it that, that are going to force governments to start offering more health insurance benefits, the federal government, state governments, local governments, to their employees. And probably one of the things that I think is the most egregious is what they've done to the church, to actually say to the church, you now have to do this, and you have to now do that. It's, it's violation of the principle of separation of church and state, which has never been that the church can't speak up on governmental issues, never been that the church can't testify. The separation of church and state has always traditionally been that the government can't meddle in the affairs of the church. But